you know, when I first started in graduate school, there was a going lore, which is if you wanted to write your first paper, you just make up a dark matter candidate, you know, motivated from these ideas, <laughs> you do sort of a calculation. I don't know if you, if you happen to have uh, the first paper that I wrote out there. I thought it would be kind of fun to, to show it to you, <laughs> simply because human eyes will never look at this paper again because it's just not important. It's, uh, it's just sort of, <laughs> there it is. So it's seen the light of day, now we can put it back into the journal and we'll, we'll never see it again. Um, but, but this is the idea. So there's the possibility of exotic particles that what, presumably they'd be produced in the, in, shortly after the Big Bang. And then, and then how do you figure out how many of these particles would remain? So imagine the Big Bang happens, there's all this energy. What's the, what's the step? Is, it, is, it, is there a well-defined procedure to figuring out how much of those dark particles will still be hanging around today? Uh, yes, indeed there is, so, um, and it's very predictive. So what we need to know is how the dark matter particles interact with the standard model. So that's where we have to make some kind of theory assumption. Um, but if we do that, then we can start modeling how these dark matter particles are interacting with all regular matter in the very early universe. Um, so you might have two dark matter particles come in, interact, give you some regular matter and vice versa. And the whole system can be in equilibrium. So the forward reaction happening with equal rate as the backward reaction. But as a function of time, what ends up happening is the universe is expanding. And so if you have two dark matter particles, at some point with the universe's expansion, they'll no longer be able to find each other anymore. Mm -hmm. And so and finding and, is important because that's how they. Yeah, finding is important because then that's how they can interact to give you the standard. And when they states. interact, they disappear by producing more right. ordinary stuff. Good. Exactly. Yeah. So once they can no longer find each other, then they're just uh, this interaction stops. Yep. Um, and and then however many dark matter particles are around at that point in time stays essentially constant until today, and that's the, the amount that we measure. So you can actually calculate what this interaction rate is, accounting for the expansion of the universe, and get a, a, a specific prediction for the amount of dark so matter So we have a rough today. version of that calculation right here. Now, of course, you don't have to understand the mathematics behind this, but the point is there is a well-defined, rigorous mathematical procedure that allows us to figure out how much of this dark stuff would be hanging around. And the wonderful, beautiful, perhaps unexpected fact is that when you do this calculation for supersymmetric particles, the typical amount that will remain for the stable ones is pretty close to the amount of dark matter that observations suggest should be out there.